Richard. I'd like to welcome everyone to the October Egg Market Situation and Outlook webinar, uh, the, the newest edition of this series. Uh, we have about an hour planned for you in terms of some comments, and then we'd be happy to take any questions you might have uh, at the end of the time. Brian, did you want to take questions uh, or just... Yeah, I can right, if, right after I'm finished if there are any, and then, and then I got a, another thing I got to go to. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, so if you have any questions for Brian, please share them. Uh, Frayne is uh, unavailable today, but he did record some remarks, so he won't be able to answer questions. Uh, but you're de definitely welcome to, to ask, and we can get them to him. Uh, but uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Feel free to use the Q&A tool or the comment box. We can answer both ways. Uh, you can answer as we're going or, or right at the end if you'd like. Um, but with that, I'd like to kick it over to Brian Parman. Yeah, uh, thanks, Dave. So like I said, uh, I have a uh, an appointment uh, here uh, after this, so I, I'm not going to be able to hang out to the end. So if there are any questions, go ahead and uh, for my presentation, put them in the chat. I'll hang on for a few minutes to see if if there are any, and uh, then I've, I've got to go. Uh, the other th uh, thing I wanted to mention is we have our uh, annual Ag Lenders Conference be kicking off next week. Monday's in Grand Forks, Tuesday's in Minot, Wednesday is in Bismarck, and Friday is is in Fargo. And so I, I don't know, if, uh, you know, we do allow some walk-ins for that and everything. And if you want more information, just contact us. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. And today... Uh, I haven't given a fertilizer outlook in a while, and so I thought today I would go ahead and update it for people uh, potentially making fall planning decisions and to give an idea where we're where we're sitting for for our fertilizer uh, price heading heading into uh, the fall. Uh, I know mostly folks are worried about harvest right now and and marketing and get, getting grain to and from their own on farm storage or the elevators, but it, you know it's like I've said. Fertilizer prices are typically the lowest in a, in a calendar year uh, in the fall. And while it's tough to make planting decisions and you kind of you kind of hem yourself in a little bit when you when you make these purchase uh, decisions early, uh, at the same time, you can save quite a bit of money on that. So with that, um, talking about uh, fertilizer prices, uh, 2022 was the peak for pretty much all of the major fertilizer products that we we use. Uh, and since that time, it's really been a downward trend coming coming into right now where uh, all four major nitrogen products, which includes the liquids UANs 28 and 32, uh, anhydrous gas, of course, and then urea, uh, they're basically all down 50% across the board from where they were, uh, you know, the, the spring of 2022. With and, and you know the last time they were this low was was 2021 heading into heading into next spring you'd have, you'd have to go back that far uh, and pretty much that was coming after that period from 2016 to 2021 where it really fertilizer prices by and large especially the nitrogen fertilizers were just kind of hovering in between you know when it came to urea for instance from 2015 to 40 cents a pound or so 45 cents per pound to n shooting all the way up over a dollar 10 per pound to n and then here the most recent which came out the 11th uh, uh urea was down to about 50 to 55 cents per pound of n and urea has pretty much been trending down uh in 2024 since the spring <clears throat> you know typically in a, in a typical year when we don't have logistical log jams and pandemics that we're coming out of, you'll typically see a little bit of a, a increase in fertilizer prices starting about late February, March, April, and then possibly even into May. And then it creeps back down with the, you know, basically cycling with the planting season. And you look here where 2024 is sitting uh, just last week at, at under $500 a ton for, for urea, uh, in in 2022 this this time it was it was closer to uh, 800 a ton so significantly cheaper peaking that spring in 22 at over a thousand dollars a ton so you know down more than 50 percent from from the peak a couple of years ago and starter fertilizer kind of the same story there uh starter hasn't come down below the five-year average in the same way that urea has but really in the last three or four weeks there's been a pretty big drop 
in, in well, actually, let's call it two months, pretty big drop in starter fertilizer prices coming down from about 650 bucks a ton down below $500 a ton. So just kind of trickling along there. And, and you can see just the downward trend in urea and, and starter fertilizer prices uh, since, since last spring and, and last summer. Now, as far as phosphorus and phosphate fertilizers, there's kind of been a floor built into those you know, they were closer before the pandemic and everything else in, in uh, closer to about 500, 550 bucks a ton uh, for, for these products. And they haven't come down in sa the similar fashion to the nitrogen fertilizers. And a big reason for that has been the tariffs that have been requested and, and implemented uh, by the Commerce Department. So you look and as recently 2021, uh, they wanted to take uh, phosphorus prices higher. Duties dropped then from 19%. So back up real quick. Morocco is a major exporter of phosphorus. So while we produce a lot in the United States of the phosphorus we use, Morocco produces a lot of phosphorus for the rest of the world, as does Russia. And so if phosphor, the, the other 20% or 25% of phosphorus that we take in in the U.S., uh, if it's you know, levied a 15, 19% tariff that raises the phosphorus price coming into the United States significantly. And it increases the amount that, that domestic producers are able to charge. And so that's sort of what's happened. It went from not much of a duty to 19, almost 20%, then dropped down to 2% as they're fighting this out. And then the commerce department somewhat recently uh, suggested they're going to, they're raising it or have raised it to 14.2%. And it's put a floor in these phosphorus prices that makes it so that returning to the pre-pandemic levels just really is unlikely uh, until until politically this changes. It's it's it is supply and demand driven, but when you put tariffs on things, it, it puts a floor in there that 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 is just not going to fall below. Uh, and then potash prices is it, again similar story, a uh, huge spike in twenty twenty two. Uh, almost 900 bucks a ton and then you look and it's trended down just like uh, just like starter fertilizer beginning around August September uh, down now to almost 450 dollars a ton and the lowest that it's been again since since 2021. So pretty much across the board fertilizer prices have dropped phosphorus being kind of held up there with uh, with what's gone on with the tariff situation with that but nitrogen fertilizers and and potash all down uh, 50 percent off their peaks and kind of trending towards that price that we saw from 2015 through through uh, 2020 or so and then what's that's kind of done then is you look at what happened with fertilizers during that spike and this is fertilizer costs for specifically for uh, 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 corn right or fertilizer cost per acre share of cost per acre and during the spike, it was up closer to 25%. So 25% of production costs uh, basically across the board were uh, uh, or for corn were 25%. Now, uh, 2023, that was down to 20. 2024, it's going to come, it, it will have come down even further, probably closer to 18% or so. And 2025, if this trend continues, we could see even a lower share of fertilizer costs being um, uh share of the budget. And speaking of the budget, so I pulled, for instance, this is from Southeast North Dakota's budgets that, that Ron puts together. And I just wanted to show, for example, because that's a, a fairly higher yielding area, but not the valley also, but, but significantly higher than the West and part of the Northern regions. But corn, for instance, right around 170 bushels, uh, fertilizer was was basically $152 per, per acre projected at ended in 24. Wheat, 97 bucks an acre, canola, 88, and both sunflowers, 53 to 54 bucks an acre in fertilizer uh, costs. You know, when you look at, for instance, oil, oil seeds, that, that's again like that 25% with corn, you know, pretty close to that, maybe, maybe slightly more. Uh, spring wheat, uh, that's more like 50% or a little under 50%, let's say 45% of the total production cost there. So we can expect that as we as we head into this spring, we're probably going to see some relief in, in overall fertilizer 
uh, cost per acre. But it is something to mention that this may be uh, a time again where we start seeing prices move more uh, seasonally and less based on world events, with the exception again of phosphorus. Uh, I, you know, you pre-price phosphorus this fall, and all of a sudden the tariffs come off, and then the prices are way lower. Those, those that's that's a bit unpredictable right now. But for the remainder of the products, uh, probably going to see something that we're definitely going to need a reduction in overall fertilizer cost per acre headed into this spring. And you know, Frain's going to talk about uh, commodity prices and everything else, but. You know, it, it's been a big point of concern for the last two years, 22 and 23, especially with what's gone on with fertilizer prices. But it looks like we're I, I got asked a long time ago, many, many times, when will we see fertilizer prices come back down? When will we see fertilizer prices return? Well, here it is. I mean, it's it's basically returning and it is so far it's taken about almost three years, two and a half, three years to return back to the, the prices that we were seeing pre, pre pandemic. So with that, uh, are there any questions or, or, uh, comments on fertilizer prices or, or anything else headed into this spring? Like I said, I'll be, I'll hang on for a minute. Um, while Dave gets uh frames recorded presentation ready to go. If there are any questions, you can put them in the chat or the Q and a, and I'll see. Uh, one question, how likely would it be for the tariffs to come off? That's that's the question. And it seems like there's different entities. You, you know, you got the Commerce Department um, reviewing and then you've got the there's a judicial system in there. And I'm not an expert in international trade law or anything like that. But you do have some differences of opinion as far as the courts and then the, the Commerce Department on what the tariff should be. The courts had sent it back like it needed to be revisited. Then the Commerce Department revisits it and says, yep, the tariffs are fine. But then they came down some. I did read that uh, Mosaic is not going to request a review of the tariffs heading into next spring, which means they're basically happy with them. I, I would guess that that means they're happy with them at 14, 14 and a half percent. Uh, I'm not sure what would have to happen. I mean, this this entire situation has been reviewed and revisited and uh, evaluated for going on four years now. And so far, the tariffs have kind of been stubborn and, and stayed there. So I guess it's not very likely unless something changes or there's a shift in uh, belief in, in how much low phosphorus prices are hurting uh, our own companies. And and I guess one last thing I'll say on that. The concern is you, you would say, well, we, we get rid of the tariffs, but phosphorus is such a critical resource that in some ways the tariffs are being put on to protect companies that produce it domestically so that we ensure that those companies stay afloat and we have a ready, ready supply because we need it. But at the same time, you know, how high is too high is the question. And it, if at all. And I don't know the answer to that. Uh, and if you asked somebody, three different people, if you ask the the judicial review that, that reviews this stuff, maybe they're too high. If you ask Mosaic, maybe they're too low. And if you ask farmers, they're way too high. Uh, so that's 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 a tough one to answer. Um, probably not. Probably not what you were looking for. But that's kind of this kind of the situation as it is. All right. So I do not see any more questions. Um, Thank you. And if you are going to the Ag Lenders Conference, I will I will see you there. Thanks again. And uh, up next is Frayne Olson's uh, recorded presentation. Economist and marketing specialist here at NDSU Extension. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what's happening in the grain markets right now and give you a recap of what happened to the October uh, USDA reports, both the WASDE report, which is the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates, as well as the production report. Um, here's my contact information. So if there's some things that come up later or you have some questions you want to, want to talk about, I'd be happy to do that. My email as well as my cell phone number. The cell phone number is probably a little bit more reliable than the office number at this point because I am going to be doing quite a bit of traveling over the next uh, several weeks. Um, so again, just um, try and use my cell phone because I think that'll be more reliable for everybody. So really quickly to start uh, the slides, uh, just to provide a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about. So the WASDE and production reports, when you look at it in aggregate, in total, uh, 
considered slightly negative for corn, somewhat neutral for soybeans and wheat prices. There was, wasn't a lot of shock value in it. There wasn't a lot of big um, uncertainty or a lot of argument over the numbers. We basically did some refinement, some tweaking uh, to the estimates that I think everybody was expecting to see. And I'll go through those in just a moment. Um, second, when we think about harvest progress, kind of where we are right now, uh, kind of heat of the heat of the of the the harvest season right now. When we look nationally, at least as of uh, this last Monday, the report that we got on the crop progress report, uh, corn currently we're about 47% harvested versus a five-year average of about 39%. So a little bit ahead of normal. Again, very good. Um, um, Harvest conditions, relatively dry, nice warm days, been a few places that have had some rain showers, but in general, the Corn Belt has been warm and dry. Uh, soybeans, kind of the same story, currently about 67% uh, harvested versus about 51% as the five-year average. So again, we're a little bit ahead of the normal pace. Uh, we're getting some harvest selling. We're getting a little bit of, of pressure on the marketplace right now because of that harvest selling. This is something we see typically every year. I do want to make a couple comments because we're in this funny transition zone between what's happening here in the U.S. and harvest reports and production numbers coming out of the United States, as well as starting to shift the emphasis and focus on what's going on in South America, in particular in Brazil and the Brazil soybean planting. So right now, um, soybean planting progress, as far as the actual progress, is relatively slow, um, a little bit behind what we normally see this time of year. I don't have the specific numbers at this point, uh, but it's it, we're just kind of getting rolling within the Brazilian uh, soybean planting. The challenge we're facing, though, is we're most of the marketplace is expecting a pretty significant increase in projected production. So again, that's total bushels or total tons produced. Conab, which is kind of the, I would say the like the USDA version in Brazil, um, is is currently forecasting about a 12.7 percent increase in production from last year. Now last year wasn't a record production, but it was near record production. So again, this is a combination of returning back to a trend line yield, as well as adding some additional uh, planted acreage. So. Um, in fact, the CONAB numbers, the one coming directly out of Brazil, are slightly below what the current USDA forecasts are. So very, very uh, high expectations for both corn and soybean production out of Brazil and, and as well as Argentina um, coming up for the next year. And of course, that's also what's playing into the mentality of the marketplace, putting kind of this downward pressure or, or, or not a, a big concern from the buyer standpoint about, about worrying where their supplies are going to be coming from. But I'll give you a brief update on kind of what the current weather conditions are and, and where we might be headed in the near future. So let's look at the USDA numbers very quickly, start with the production report. So again, this is an estimate or a summary of, of updates for projection for not only national average yields and total production, but also a state by state breakdown. As usual, what I've done is the top row over here and that highlighted in blue is the average market estimate. So this is what the, the traders on average were expecting to see out of the report. I do list the highest and the lowest trade estimates within those companies that supplied information into the survey. I used uh, also included some numbers from last year just as kind of a benchmark or reference point. The black row highlighted is the numbers we got last year in September, uh, last month, excuse me, in September. And of course, the red on the very bottom is the numbers we got as of last Friday. And what I want to remind everybody, again, usually when we think about market response, we think about what price changes do we see as a result of these reports, what we really need to do is compare the red line on the very bottom with the blue line on the very top. Because it's not, it's not last year's or last uh, month's numbers that are so important. It's more important about what we expected to see. So let's go through and compare that very quickly. Starting with corn, I'm going to start with the yield numbers. The, the average trade estimate, we were looking and, and anticipating a slight reduction in the, in the average yield, national average yield. And in fact, we actually got a slight increase. Now, my personal view, and this is just me speaking now, my personal view is I do think that increase was primarily because of some higher test weights. Even though there's been 
I'll show you a, a drought monitor map here in a little bit. Even though it's been relatively dry for, for quite a while now, we're seeing some drier conditions, not only here in North Dakota and the mid, upper Midwest and, and Northern Plains, but also in the core Corn Belt. And we've had, but we've also had some very nice weather, very nice warm fall. The, the, the corn plants have been able to mature on a very nice, timely basis. And so I do think some of that slight increase that U.S. is reporting is in anticipation of some uh, a little bit heavier test weights. We don't have any early frost damage. Everything to be, seems to be maturing and drying down naturally. So that's just kind of my take on why the number went up and so, instead of went down slightly. So as a result, when we look at total bushels produced, a slight increase in the total expected production. Shifting to soybeans, basically no change. Um, the, the only change that, that we see because of the slight uh, change in the, in the yield or the total production estimates is with a slight adjustment in the harvested acreage number. So basically no shock value at all within the soybeans, came in almost exactly with what the wet trade was expecting. A slight increase in the corn production when we were actually expecting a slight decrease. Thus the um, somewhat negative pressure put on soybeans as a result of the report. Moving on to kind of the supply and demand, we have both the supply side, which I just talked about, as well as the demand side. What I'm really reporting here is that bottom line. How much grain do we think we're going to have in inventory about this time next year? So what are we looking at for? Are the bins going to be full coming into harvest next year? Or are, we going to, are they going to be relatively empty coming into next year? And of course, that has a, a big impact on price and price expectations. So once again, when we compare the blue line to the red, the, what the market was expecting to see versus what we actually got. When we look at wheat, now this is all wheat classes blended together. It's not just spring wheat. It's not just winter wheat or hard red winter wheat. This is all wheat classes blended together. Um, we, we did see a slight drawdown or slight reduction in what the wheat production or, excuse me, ending stocks were going to be. Now, we're not talking just about production. This is ending stocks. What is our inventory is going to look like? Now those small, there were several small adjustments made in the wheat balance sheet. We had a, a slight increase in harvest area. We had a slight decrease in yields. Um, again, very small tweaks here and there. We had a slight increase in imports and then a slight increase in feed consumption. So when you run that all through the calculator and you get to the bottom line, small changes, but we are starting to tighten up that bottom line on the wheat numbers just a tiny bit. Again, these are still relatively robust numbers. They're not necessarily uh, numbers that every, everybody's going to be worried about. We're still going to have ample supplies of wheat within the United States. Moving to the corn numbers in the middle, when again the trade was expecting a slight decrease in our carryover stocks, we actually got a slight increase. That's really primarily because of that increase in the production numbers. So very small numbers, uh, uh, changes to the consumption side, basically not even worth talking about or noting. And then we get to the soybean and essentially there was no changes in the soybean. So our ending stocks numbers remained unchanged. The market was not expecting any big adjustments. So again, not a lot of shock value. This is a matter of kind of tweaking and nudging and, and making some refinements. Now we are also at the point of the year where from here on forward, we're, we will likely not see any big adjustments in the production side. If we do get some adjustments or some shocks or something unexpected happening from the USDA reports, it will likely be on the demand side. Okay, so I'll, most of the rest of the winter, I'm gonna be talking about the demand expectations in particular exports and what that might mean for future prices. So let's shift a little bit into what's happening in South America. And I do want to give you an update. This is some stuff that I've talked about before. Um, this is a map, and I keep changing the maps here a little bit. I want to kind of keep it fresh, but I also want to give you a little bit different perspective. So this is the soil moisture anomaly. So let's look at what, it, what would we normally see for soil moisture at this, at this time of the year compared to what we're seeing today. And as you can, you can obviously with all of the red on this map, there's a lot of concern saying, well, we're starting, the Brazilians are starting their production season for the vast majority of where they produce corn and soybeans at a deficit. So they're coming into the springs work in a very, very dry, um, dry conditions, except for these southern regions. So when we think about the major soybean producing region, we obviously think about Mato Grosso, which is in the north. That's where they're starting their planting progress. 
Um, and, uh, and, and the planting progress in the north has been a little bit slow to get started because of that dry soil moisture conditions. Um, they have a long planting window. They have a lot of flexibility in their planting, especially as you get north or closer to the equator. So the kind of the history has been if it turns out too dry, they're just going to sit back and, and wait for some rain showers and then plant it as some soil moisture. And that's what we're now starting to see. So planting progress in the northern regions in this Mato Grosso region will start picking up now and more recently. The other major producing zone for soybeans, even though this, this whole area has production in it, is kind of in this southern region. So the two kind of big pockets, there's one in the north in this Mato Grosso region, and then the other big producing region from a bushel standpoint is in the southern region. Now, the southern region of Brazil is actually in pretty good soy moisture conditions. They, they had some more rain showers later last fall. They had some more carryover moisture coming into their, their planting season now. Okay, so this is the current soy moisture condition. Okay, however, when then you look at the vegetative health. Now, most of this, the, the things that are on this vegetative health map are not necessarily corn and soybeans, obviously, because they're just starting to plant their soybeans. But these maps or these satellite imagery also includes like pasture land, it includes some forest land, it includes anything that we have vegetative activity. So it could be for some um, sugarcane acres, it could be for some cotton acres, it's not just corn and beans. Again, this map shows the deviation or the change from average. So when we, what, what kind of vegetative health, what kind of greenness in the crop will we normally see this time of year versus what we're actually seeing from satellite imagery right now today. So when you compare today versus normal, what are we seeing? And again, right now it is showing some stress in the veg vegetative health, which is confirmed then by some of the, or reinforcing the, the statement or the observations that they got very, very dry soil moisture conditions. So let's look specifically what kind of precipitation wise, when do we normally see Mato Grosso in particular, that big soybean growing region in the north where they're starting to plant now, what is their moisture cycle? So the black line in the back is their kind of long-term average moisture cycle by week. So every one of those dots is a week. The black line in, back in, in the background is kind of the average we've seen over the last several years. The gold line is last year's rainfall. So let's compare not only where we are today to last year's numbers, but also how does that compare to normal? So this is just precipitation. How much moisture has fallen in this time period? It's not accumulated moisture. It's just how much comes in that week. So notice from last, they're basically harvest as they finished up, it was very, very dry. Now that's normally a dry period for the, for the Brazilians and in particular Mato Grosso, but it was exceptionally dry. And so coming now into the planting season, beginning their, the beginning of their cropping year, we normally see the, the rainfall start to pick up. We start to get some more systems coming through. We started out relatively behind normal, but over the last two or three weeks, probably three weeks, the, the, the rainfall has starting to come. We've, even the soy moistures are very low. We've got some, some stress in the vegetative health or vegetative index. The rains are now starting to appear. And so that's one of the reasons we've seen some, a bit more of a depressed pricing in the soybean market in particular, but also some downward pressure on the corn prices is because of these rainfalls coming in now and the, the expectation that the Brazilians, especially in Mato Grosso region, will start to pick up the planting progress. What about the extended outlook? So I, I did pull this from DTN. They do have a really nice uh, some mapping system. This is the 6 to 10 day precipitation forecast. So looking forward now, what is the forecast for precipitation as we move forward? And just to re reference everybody, the Mato Grosso region is up here. So as we get into Goyos and uh, Mato Grosso do Sul and some of the other major producing regions, especially towards the east, it looks as though they are going to, the forecast right now is for these continued rain showers, not necessarily directly over Mato Grosso, but to the east of the Mato Grosso. So again, that's also this the expansion area or the growth area for these new acres of corn and soybeans are essentially to this eastern region in here. And so this is also right now the combination of some rainfalls that have happened over the last several weeks, as well as a forecast for some additional rainfall coming over the next uh, seven, next eight, uh, six to 10 days. You know, again, putting a little bit of 
of uh, taking some of that risk premium that we've seen building into the soybean market in particular, starting to see some of that taken out of the marketplace. So as we move forward, these are some of the things we're going to be talking about a lot into the rest of the growing season for South America. And in particular, what does that mean for our export season here out of the United States? One last comment, uh, I just don't wanted to provide a drought monitor map here for North Dakota, or for the, for the U.S., and in particular North Dakota. Um, we are seeing, and, and I think, you know, people that are listening, everybody knows the western part of North Dakota has seen some very, very dry conditions over the last several months. We're starting to see those drier regions now uh, seeping into um, especially southeastern North Dakota, and I'm, he I'm hearing some reports of guys that are trying to do some chisel, chisel plowing or putting on some fall fertilizer. It's not going very well. Um, just realize that you're not alone. A lot of the major growing regions within the United States, especially in the Midwest, have been dry for a while. The reason I wanted to focus on it right now is not only are we worried about harvest, especially for corn and beans, but we're also concerned about winter wheat seedings. So in the very bottom here in the, in, the, in the blue, when we look at current winter wheat seeding, so this would be both hard red winter and soft red winter wheat, we're about 64% uh, planting progress so far versus a five-year average, about 66%. So we're pretty much right on track for planting progress. But I did want to show you that those core hard red winter wheat regions of, of central and western Kansas, the panhandle part and central part of Oklahoma, as well as the panhandle of, Oklahoma, of Texas, we're a little bit on the dry side, not as dry as we've seen in the past several years, but definitely on the dry side. So that's something that, that we're going to be watching, especially as we go into the later in the fall season, looking for how, how much of a root system has been developed, what is kind of the crop condition for the winter wheat as it, as, as it goes into the winter months. So with that, I'll conclude my re remarks. I appreciate your time and attention today. And again, don't hesitate to, to uh, reach out to me or contact me if you have any additional questions. Thank you very much. All right, Tim, that was Frayton's presentation, so over to you. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Great to be with you. Just going to give you an update on the uh, cattle situation. We're getting into that time of the year when, uh, you know, the fall calf runs start. I will say now that our uh, calf run has been delayed because of the uh, warm weather that we've had. And, uh, you know, uh, and Frayne mentioned this, the harvest is going along really well here, kind of ahead of schedule. And so that means there's crop aftermath and so on. So seen very few calves coming uh, to market yet. All, uh, but, you know, it is going to pick up. I'll show you the market report from last week. And we still had very few calves uh, uh, USDA is not even reporting all the all the markets yet, uh, and uh, and uh, but today I, I know Stockman's is having a big sale with some calves, so you know they're, they're going to start coming to, to in the market. So on a price side, uh, you know you've all seen this slide before if you've been on and cyclically we've been going up, and you know the color codes there we start with 2021 in green and. 22 in purple, 23 in blue, and then this year in red, and there's the cyclical increase. And and uh, and so uh, we were higher on calf prices earlier in the year, and maybe that was the expectation of some people, but we've uh, moderated all cattle prices except uh, cows and bulls down to about where they were last year. And there's a very good reason for that because beef production has increased quite more than many expected because we're just keeping uh, uh, cattle on feed a lot longer. We, we'll see the prices in a minute, but eight, seven, 800 pound steers are relatively high price. So, and, and corn is cheap has already uh, been mentioned. And so feedlots are keeping uh, cattle uh, longer because the replacements are so high. And, uh, you know, with the fed cattle prices we'll look at later, it's just paying them to put on more weight and they're putting on enough weight to amount to the equivalent of about 20 to 25,000 more head uh, per week. So even though we have fewer animals, 
It isn't the animals that affect prices. It's the amount of beef. And interestingly enough, we're on track now to produce the same amount of beef as we, as we did last year. So no surprise then, if we're producing the same amount of beef, uh, cattle prices would be the same. And we'll see that except for our cows that we'll get to in a minute. So calf prices are down, you know, about 290 where on an average, and again, there's a wide range and, and, and will be continue to be a wider and wider range in calf prices as we get into the heavier marketing for all the different market factors that affect them. They still are very much supported at record high uh, prices near last year's level. And so, you know, I think they, you know, they, they, I think there's weakness ahead as the runs hit. I just talked to my counterpart in Oklahoma last week or, or earlier in the week here. And, uh, and uh, they've already down there, it's dry as Frayne mentioned. And so they're moving calves down there. And so, uh, you know, that's going to to uh, put a lid on prices for sure till we get to the end. Now, you know, at the, you know, the lowest usually does occur here in October, maybe it'd be a, bit, a little bit later this year, but then we do usually see a spark at the end of the year now, for a number of reasons. Frayne mentioned uh, wheat grazing, and uh, again, my counterparts down there said there is no wheat grazing now, and the prospects do not look good unless they start getting rain down there. That the uh, you know, even though the planting progress is going, it's being planted into dust, and there isn't any wheat grazing, so not expecting a spark there unless they get rain. Another thing that happens uh, towards the end of the year is that uh, after the corn belt buyers get their corn in the grain in 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 the bin, uh, they they, they come in and start hitting our markets up here. And we're expecting more of that this year because of the low price of corn. When corn is high, they would tend to sell it. But when they got a lot of corn, which is a good corn crop this year, and, and prices are low, they would tend to feed calves. So we're expecting that southern Minnesota, Iowa to to give us some a boost there and then also the the later we go the more of a chance that the calves are weaned and so then they have more value it might be the same calves but a wean calf would just be worth more so that would spark the the uh the help to spark the market at the end but we're in for you know uh, several weeks of pressure on prices because of this uh we're in the the heavy marketing season same way on the yearling cattle then, uh, very good prices throughout the year. Again, they've backed off uh, some and are just a little bit above where they were uh, last year. And uh, we'll again, we'll look at the market report there in a minute, but right about $264 there per hundred weight. Uh, there's the futures market in red and those red dots there, the feeder cattle futures market that is seven to eight ninety nine weight cattle. And, uh, you know, that's showing uh, down similar to last year. We've been running quite a positive basis on our uh, seven to eight weight cattle up here compared to the, what, the, what the futures is based on the CME cash settlement price that's uh now around 250 and you know we're up there 10 to 15 dollars above that so you know we'll pro probably stay kind of above where those those uh, futures are and so again uh uh there's usually pressure on the market this time of the year because all the calves coming to market and and so uh you know that's probably going to be the case but but supported at or above uh, last year's levels, which are still uh, record levels there. And just kind of remember these prices because I, I'll, I'll be talking about backgrounding in a minute. So here's the market report from from uh, last week. Uh, two markets reported last week were Kist and Stockman's, but, uh, you know, not a high volume at Kist. In fact, you know, you circle there in the left, we only had 81 at the, uh, 550 to 6 weight steer calves at at those markets and they happen to be all at stockman's kiss didn't even have any at that at that weight group so kind of a thin market reported there but right at about 290 again the air over there to heifers are always uh, discounted quite a lot at this time of the year and that remains I've got two uh, fifty-eight or eight fifty-eight pounders circle there at two fifty-three because the next thing I want to talk here about is the potential for backgrounding, which is the hot topic now. Should I sell my calves at these high prices or should I background them? We do have a website 
for backgrounding and the um, the address is shown up there. It's a long one. I don't know how they came up with that long uh, 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 website address. But anyway, if you just Google NDSU backgrounding cattle, it'll come up. Last year's is still on there, but we're in the process of updating that by November 1st. We will have it updated, and then the topics are shown below. Brian's going to show some budgets. I'm going to talk about what I'm talking about now, market outlook and price protection, and Carl's going to do feed costs. We have two new animal science, extension animal science, and mine it and, and uh, heading her, and so they're going to talk about some some uh, feeding background and calves and so on. So that'll uh, that'll be recordings of by us and will be available about November 1st on that website just give you a little bit of preview I do have a backgrounding budget on my website again the address is showing up there and it's an excel spreadsheet so you can change it around but I just been you know every day or so throwing in some prices and so, uh, you know, starting at the top, I'm just taking 550s in and 850 steers out. My projected selling price is, uh, I have a 242. Remember, last week, they brought, those 858s brought 253, but the futures yesterday were 242.95, and that's what LRP is. So I just put in 242 there, and I put in 290 uh, for uh for a calf price again there's probably going to be some weakness in the next couple of weeks but you know you can put in whatever number you want to but this is just to give us an idea if backgrounding uh, might be profitable today and then going on down i'm not going to go through all those costs at the bottom then i just used a, a hay corn and canola meal ration for corn prices i put in 350 today at an ethanol plant in western north dakota they're paying third 333 so it's less than that but the further east you're going might be higher and, and again for producers with their own uh, corn uh, probably can't get 350 in most places for that but if you're buying corn probably going to be more than 350 but anyway put your own I, I just put 350 in there to give us an idea so if we go to that circle blue it looks like you know um, you know a, a, a chance to make some money to, to keeping the calves uh, longer and, and and putting weight on them the feedlots down south prefer to buy 850 pounders rather than 550 they want us to put the weight on here because our corn prices are you know 330 40 50 or whatever and their uh, corn price in omaha today is i think four or 405 or something like that and so corn prices are higher so now uh, you know I, we usually do background a lot of calves and i expect uh to do to that again just kind of remember that break even price for selling is at 225 and this then that 139 dollars or 140 near dollars includes a 56 dollar uh lrp and so how i got that is then yesterday and and good today is uh going into the beginning of march uh across there uh when you get over there to the coverage price was right at what the futures were the futures yesterday closed at 242.95 closed off 50 cents uh, from that today so down to to 242.45 so maybe the coverage price will drop a little bit uh, today for lrp but you could lock in 242.98 the premium for producers is 660 100 weight there so you see uh at a you know 660 100 weight times your 8.5 gives you that uh 50 over 56 dollars one thing though you might consider and this is all between producers and uh and uh, lenders and the uh insurance agent is how much coverage do you need how much risk do you have and uh so uh what i did there is just go up and again your break even price is 225.59 so you can come down to the bottom here and get uh, a 230 which is you know five bucks over your break even price and you can blop half if you're worried about that uh, you know paying 56 dollars ahead for protection you could lower it all depends on your risk you know uh, in the upper part of the price cycle we want to put a floor on but leave the top side open and 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 that could that could happen and and so it's just the amount of risk you have and and keep in mind that you can you can pick different uh, levels of, of, of coverage there 
So, you know, here's Fed steer prices. And, and again, those heavier weight yearling prices are going to be dependent on the Fed cattle futures uh, next year when they, they finish because the uh, feedlots can, it can hedge into that. And that's how much they're willing to pay for feeder cattle. And so, uh, uh, there's the fed cattle prices again, the same story on them. They're about the same as they were last year, simply because we're producing the same amount of beef as we did last year. The futures are the gold squares there. And I think, you know, we can do better than that on, on futures and be better if everything comes, if, if beef demand holds and everything. And you see fed cattle are going up right now. The, the, uh, holiday demand for beef is setting in. We've moved the cutout value you up 20 bucks in the last two weeks from three dollars up to 320 and so you know the middle meats are really really strong the retailers were hand to mouth because the cutout and fed cattle were going down and now it's going up now they're short bought and so they got to get after it and and so that's helping to spark the uh, the uh, fed cattle prices right now so anyway call call prices then uh uh, are also seasonally going down and we expect them to continue to go down as more cows are pregnancy checked and come to market. It's a normal thing as you can see there. So there's pressure on cow prices. Again, mine there at about a hundred and sixteen dollars or so are the low end of cow prices these would be broken mouth cows that have had a calf on them all summer the 85 to 90 percent lean is the the this average i use we, we don't report usda doesn't report cow call price in north dakota but they do in south dakota and montana so i just average those two for these lean cows but just be aware here's a auction market in north dakota from monday and i realize that there are cows bringing more than 116 17 some bringing 140 or so the uh, the higher yielding uh, cows and so on so a wide range in cow prices depend on quality but the trend is the same uh, downward into for sure into the next uh, month or so but supported at at, at, my, at better levels than last year because our beef cow slaughter is down about uh, 16 and a half percent uh, over last year and so fewer cows coming to market because of the better weather conditions we have and then we have fewer cows so as uh, uh, Brian mentioned just a reminder that our egg lenders conferences are next week and and starting in Grand Forks on Monday and so uh, just a reminder if you are a lender and haven't registered uh, it's too late to register but you can do walk-ins except uh, for Fargo if you would uh, call the department here at uh, uh, Two uh, three one seven three nine three. You you could still register for Fargo that way. The others are close, so you would have to walk in. So with that, uh, stop sharing and uh, and and uh, turn it over to Ron. I'm going to talk about the livestock forage program. I've talked about that before, uh, and also some uh, wildfires. Um, before, when I talked about the LFP program, I never really mentioned much on wildfires, but now we have wildfires that are happening, so that's part of the program as well. Um, this is the up-to-date uh, drought monitor. Frayne showed you the big map of the United States. This is just a, uh, one of North Dakota, and you can, as he mentioned, uh, there's, there's really getting dry in the western part. This is released at, right as, as of this morning. And some more counties were got into the, the D3 area, which is the red area. If you remember, there, on the drought monitor, there's, there's different levels of drought, D2 to D4. And um, uh, for the livestock, uh, uh, for the, um, for the um, uh, forage, livestock forage program, um, if you hit D3 at any point in any, in any part of the county, you automatically qualify as a LFP county and 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 are eligible for some uh, for some payments. So those red counties hit uh, D3. And so the ones that were added, there, there was some in the counties last week: Divide, Williams, Slope, Bowman, and Adams. And three more counties were added yes uh, on the 15th, which were Mackenzie, Golden Valley, and Billings. And all of those uh, all of those counties get uh, get three payments and i'll talk about the payments here in a little bit so a little description of the program 
the livestock forage disaster program. It, it, it offers payments to eligible li producers with eligible livestock, and you have to be in an eligible area, which is the LFP County. Uh, it it uh, pays payments to people who suffered losses, uh, grazing losses on, on native or improved uh, pasture land. And one thing that I ne usually never talk about is that it also covers qualifying fires. And but it has to be only if you are renting from a federal agency on some of the government land out west there. OK, and then there's a, a formula to follow, and I'll get into that in, in a little bit. So. All the livestock that can be covered are almost anything you can think of here. Um, uh, beef, uh, beef and buffalo and deer and anything you any anything you can think of. Most of the time we're just talking about beef cattle. Um, as a livestock producer, you must own or or, or own or uh, cash rent uh, this this uh, uh, pasture, uh, and you must provide it uh, provide land for the livestock on that on that uh, on that area that's qualified for the drought or the fire. These events may be uh, e either the following: um, physically located in one of those counties or managed by a federal agency on some of the federal grasslands, okay? So that kind of kicked into play now with the fires from out, from out west, okay? Next thing, you need to file anything. They give you 30 days after the calendar year. So you need to file your information before January 30th, 2025. I would say get on it right now and get, it, get, get going on it. Talk to FSA, uh, um, and they will tell you how to do that. There is a payment limitation of 125,000, and then with most government programs, you're subject to that 900,000 adjusted gross income limit as well. Um, we do have a spreadsheet online, the LFP spreadsheet, and there's the link. Um, this gives you an estimate of what your payments could possibly be, um, and I haven't updated it now for the new counties, but I'll be I'll be working on that. Uh, so this is just a screenshot of what it looks like. Um, some It's right on the extension page under farm management. Pretty easy to get to. You just plug in your, your state and your county. You put in the number of adult head and, and non-adult head here. I'm just having this simple example. These are the payments for this current year. So let's say we have 100, 100 head of adults and 25 of, of non-adults that weigh over 500 pounds. This is the possible feed cost then $6,200. Okay, then you need to put in the number of acres. Let's say we just had 600 acres of native and 300 approved. The, uh, this program will automatically pl plug in your, your um, animal units and it comes up with 5,200. You need to take the lesser of those two, 6,200 or 5,200, and then it plugs into the formula here. So you're eligible, and, and then being you're in the, in the county that hit D3, you're eligible for three payments. Uh, so you multiply it by three and you get $8,900 is your estimate. So it's a pretty good deal for, for, those, or, for those in those counties and they automatically get, get some money from the government. Now I wanna talk specifically about the wildfires. There's a few little little things here that we need to be concerned about. The grazing losses due to fire have to be on the federally managed rangeland, okay? And if it prohibits the grazing. Now the LFP program, that has the grazing period from, from um, April 15th through October 15th. So it's now, it's now ended, okay? So here are the provisions. You need to be in one, uh, one of the eligible counties um, it's only a lot loss on grazing on federal lands. Uh, you must have been forced to remove your livestock. If there was a fire, but you didn't really have to move your livestock, you just put them in another area, that really wouldn't count. Uh, you get paid on the days from the fire to October 15th. I think that main fire start, well, a lot of it started on October 10th. Um, so you got about five days of payments you could get. The payments are based on a daily basis of half the month monthly cost. I wanted to mention too, there's also what they call the ELAP program. That could reimburse uh, the producers for transportation costs on feed or livestock. And that is for the whole calendar year. And that is for areas that are um, in, in D2 for eight weeks or D a drought monitor of D3 or greater. 
contact your FSA and they'll help you with all these various provisions. I wanted to show you some of these tremendous pictures of the fires out west there. Yeah, you, you probably heard that two people actually got burned up in the fire and died from it. They couldn't outrun the fire. There was farmers that were driving tractors into shelter belts to start, try save their tractors to get them away from the fire. Uh, it just was quite amazing uh, to, to the, the, what happened out there in those areas. I think it was 100, 110,000 acres I heard that burned or, or even more. And, and here there's even a plane trying to drop some some uh, some fire retardant on on the on the ground and and there's and one the bad thing it burned up a lot of the power poles so they're without power it's a real mess there's a farmstead that just got burned to the ground you can see that that's near Tioga that's where one of the main fires were um, so just wanted to show you that and tell you a little bit about the wildfire part of the LFP program Contact your FSA and they will help you get through that. I'll entertain questions at the end. Now I'll turn it over to Dave. All right, thanks, Ron. That was some amazing pictures. A lot has been going on in bioenergy uh, in the last month. I'm gonna focus on some bigger stories as related to the Sustainable Aviation Fuel or SAF. Uh, the big takeaway from all of this is that SAF has arrived. Um, it was, it was actually here a little bit earlier, uh, but the next couple of stories will uh, make that even more evident. Uh, one of the more local stories, uh, technology company Jivo bought Red Trail uh, Ethanol, uh, which is located in Richardson. Jivo uh, is in the SAF business. They have an alcohol to jet technology, so they take ethanol uh, and transform it into jet fuel. Uh, they purchased Red Trail, uh, I think, for for one big reason, uh, and that's because they have carbon capture and storage on site. They're located above uh, proper geology, and they've actually been capturing and storing CO2 for a while now. Uh, but this gives Jivo uh, access to that, and that's really important. One, because you have a smaller carbon footprint, and that has a variety of benefits. But the biggest one is likely that it almost completely ensures that the pro the production of of SAF uh, at Red Trail would be eligible for that forty five Z tax credit, and so an extra dollar seventy five a gallon, so a substantial amount of money. Uh, and it, there's kind of two side notes to this too. Uh, you know, we we're still you know there's still work being done to build the summit pipeline. Uh, this essentially means that Jivo has access to geology without the pipeline, which is big because most folks don't. Um, and then that their other facility, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, has a different angle. And so the big piece of news, there's actually two of them that came out today. This is one of them. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy, their loan programs office, guaranteed almost $3 billion to two different SAF projects. Uh, the first is a GEVO project in South Dakota. So this was a, a, a green field from the ground up corn ethanol plant and then alcohol to jet facility um, located in Southeast South Dakota, uh, 60 million gallons of SAF. Uh, just a little bit of a tidbit too for, for everyone. It takes 1.7 gallons of ethanol to produce a, a gallon of SAF. So this is, you know, a, almost 100 million gallon ethanol refinery before it goes into SAF, so really quite large. And it also have distillers, grains, and corn oil. Uh, the other loan guarantee went to Calumet Great Falls. And so that's a renewable diesel facility. They've also made SAF recently, um, expanding their existing uh, refinery to 315 million gallons. And just so you understand the scale of this, I mean, that's, that's tremendously large. Um, the Calumet Great Falls was built originally as an oil refinery and uh, just like the Calumet Dickinson, which is now Marathon, uh, was built. But, you know, that expansion would really have a, a very large uh, footprint here or have a large catchment area for, for vegetable oil. And just back of the envelope, it would basically require all of the oil from our 2023 soybean crop here in North Dakota to, to supply it. Um, 
And again, Great Falls is in small grain country. It'll be interesting to see exactly where they're going to get their oil from in the future. But that's a, a really big mouth to feed that would you know likely be coming on in the next year or two. Um, story number three out of four. Uh, this one also just came out this morning. So Southwest Airlines has an offtake agreement with, uh, it's actually Diamond Green Diesel. So they're a, a renewable diesel refinery in Louisiana. And they're a JV between Valero, who you may know is an is a oil refinery or an integrated oil company. And then Darling Ingredients. And Darling is really interesting because they're very involved in the, the, the tallow fat oil grease space. Um, and this is the JV that they have. And what they're actually going to do is they're going to move that SAF up to Chicago midway uh, beginning possibly the fourth quarter of 2025. 3.6 billion gallons, so not a huge amount, um, but kind of moving into that space. And then the last one, the last story I'll talk about is a, a flight taken by Delta from Minneapolis, St. Paul to New York last month, late last month. And they used winter Camelina-based SAF to do that. So they you know, we grew the Camelina here in the region. Uh, it was crushed at Cargill, West Fargo, which is a soft seed crush plant. Uh, that oil was then transported to Great Falls and refined at Calumet, then taken uh, to MSP for the flight. Uh, and again, I think the big thing to take away from this, you know, the last two stories, you know, 7,000 gallons isn't much. 3.6 gallons on the whole isn't much. But with that loan guarantee and some of the other volumes, if you remember might have been July or August when I spoke about the expansion of SAF capacity in California. It's clearly come uh, to commercial scale quite quickly, and we'll definitely expect that to grow. Um, now we'll move on to questions. Uh, our next webinar is about in a month, so it'll be Thursday, November 14th. Uh, and as mentioned, our egg lenders conferences are coming up uh, in a few days. So beginning on Monday, we'll be in Grand Forks and continue on as been mentioned before. Uh, and with that, we'll open up for questions. Okay. I know that we yeah. already have one. Yeah, I've got two questions. Uh, or yeah. There are two questions. I'll take them both. One is, it, would there be any advantage in since feeding cattle to heavier weights to take him to background to heavier weights? That's a, you know, a, your own decision and your own uh, budget in past. Sometimes you get them up above 900. There aren't as many buyers and kind of limited demand. I think feedlots are going to be short of cattle, so there might be a demand there. The, the one thing to be careful of is to not get them too fleshy, and it's easier the heavier they get, they fleshy. And so uh, there, there are uh, quite substantial discounts on fleshy cattle versus just you know, backgrounding along. So that would be maybe my one concern. Otherwise, as, as long as they're uh, budgeting out, I think there will be a demand. The other question was, uh, you know, how many cattle have been lost? And we are in the process. We just had a, a call today and extensions in the process of documenting that a slow process. So far, we've documented 250 dead animals, but there are uh, many, many more unaccounted for and a lot of burned feet and now respiratory problems showing up. And so some maybe have to be euthanized and we're going to find more as the report's coming along. And, uh, you know, uh, 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 also the, the concern is fences. And so uh, j documented just in one county, 45 miles of fences. But so far, documented 250 cattle died. But it's going to be uh, quite a bit more than that when we find out and, and, and see what happens. So that's that story. Let's see. I don't know, Dave, you can get that talk of, of uh, contracts to Red Trail. Or yep. Rain, isn't Thanks, it? So. Yep, yep. Thanks. Yeah, so there's a question about uh, changes at Red Trail due to their acquisition by Jeevo regarding, you know, corn contracts. I haven't heard anything about there being changes. Um, I would frankly be a bit surprised if there were. Um, one of... In the last point, too, is about them needing less corn. No, they, they won't need less corn. I would expect that they'll build out that alcohol-to-jet back end. 
uh, to match their current refining capacity. And in fact, in, in many respects, it, it absolutely secures the economic viability of that facility for quite some time at a time when a lot of folks in ethanol are concerned, uh, which is good news. The other thing that might be good news for uh, corn farmers in the region, uh, and, I, and I know that Jivo has been doing this at Lake Preston, and I would expect that they might roll it out next year too. Uh, they do provide small premiums for certain practices or using low carbon fertilizer, all of those things. Uh, that's supported by the Climate Smart Public-Private Partnership Program. So it's a government program right now, uh, but they very much have an interest in securing lower carbon feedstocks. Again, with 45Z and a small carbon footprint already, that's all unlocked. And so farmers in the region might have a great advantage, especially if you have no-till corn. Um, could be a, a real unique opportunity. Okay, there's another question about uh, backgrounding and, and, and grazing heifers or, or putting a bull in with them, which might be more profitable. And so, uh, yeah, there's going to be, you know, all depends on whether how good the demand for replacement heifers is going to be this summer. That's the nice thing about heifers is you can uh, keep them, move them along slower, background them, and then make that decision in the spring. The farm business management records over the last 10 years bear out that that uh, selling bred heifers is uh, a little bit more profitable than on the in the backgrounding side but there you have to have a lot more management and you know that means uh, uh breeding them to good bulls and having high quality heifers and so on but uh, uh they're uh, you know we're getting we're dry in, in western north dakota all the way down through in june of this year uh, only eight percent of our cow herd was in drought in the last drought mile that come out this morning, 50% of our cow herd in the U.S. now is in drought, so we're going to need uh, uh, rains. There's no indication yet of any herd rebuilding, although in the northern plains here, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, Montana, we had a few more replacement heifers on January 1st. Unfortunately, we didn't get a January or a, a July a report this year because the USDA is out of money. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think, you know, we can, we're, we always do keep a lot of heifers in North Dakota. I think we're going to do it again, wait till spring and see what the weather's like. And uh, at that time, you know, we can decide whether to, if we have high quality heifers and so on, whether to put them in with a bull. Hey, thanks, Tim. And I think that's all of our questions. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank the other presenters and everybody for attending today. Uh, and we'll see you, if, if not next week, at Egg Lenders uh, in, in November for our next webinar. Thanks. Mm -hmm.